What's up guys, welcome back to another video. We're down here in Georgia. Today was our first day hunting. We were hunting this morning for a while, but on this video, we're gonna be talking with Dr. Mike Chamberlain and his team. They have a research project here in Georgia on public land and they have found out all kinds of interesting information about the wild turkey. Mike knows more about the turkey than anybody else that I know. So we're gonna go talk to him about the research project and see what he and his team have to say. Yeah. I'm Zach. Mike Chamberlain. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Patrick Whiteman. Nice to meet you, Zach. Ted. Mike. Pleasure to meet you. Patrick Whiteman. Nice to meet you, Ted. Sarah. You look like PA. I look like PA. Hey, I used to have the long hair, too. Yeah, you look like, kind of like you. Yeah, actually, yeah, I used to have hair down here. He used to skateboard. During COVID last year, you looked like that. You had long hair. Yeah, he was the Phil Robertson of UGA. Be new to to Georgia, I'll just explain. So you're in the Piedmont region right now. Right. And this is like the bread and butter for turkeys in the state. Uh, most of the turkey harvest comes from the Piedmont. Most of the activity here is in the Piedmont. You're not that far from Atlanta. You're not that far from Macon. So you got some large population centers that have a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so they have quick access to a bunch of state lands that are in this part of the world as well as the Coney National Forest, which is right here. Right. Um, so this is kind of Georgia DNR Wildlife Resources Division. This is kind of their bread and butter of the state, if you will, for turkeys. And if you look at the long-term declines we've seen in turkeys all over the southeast, they've been particularly precipitous in the, in the Piedmont of Georgia. Pulp production used to be super high in, the, in most Piedmont areas of the south. That's something I was reading about, too. We were reading about that last night. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it that kind of a widespread issue across yes. the south? Yeah. Yep. Like in 10, 15 years ago, it was close to four poults per hen on average. Yep. And it's just steadily dropped every yeah. year. And almost everywhere now in the southeast we see is under two poults per hen. And in some areas like Arkansas up until last year, uh, they were below one for yeah. quite a while. Yeah, I've hunted there yeah. a couple of times. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Lots of birds, right? <laughs> well, it, was, it was rough. I hunted Arkansas for the first time about seven years ago. And I think we heard two or three different birds in eight days of hunting, and we killed one. And then I went back two springs ago, and it was way worse. Mm -hmm. It was noticeably worse on all, and we covered a lot of country on public. Yeah, I get, I get as many, weather. I get as many calls and messages from people in Arkansas as any state in the southeast. Sure. About hey, what do we do? Right. Uh, I use Arkansas as an example because if you look across a lot of the, the more easterly states, you see that they're tracking on the same trajectory that Arkansas has, has gone on, but they're a few years behind. That's what we were talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was telling Ted on the drive over here. Man, these other states like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, they're, they're all headed, South yeah. Carolina. Yep. I mean, they're all kind of headed that direction. Yeah, but they'd all look the same. They're just on the decline that you saw in Arkansas started at least the the drop in harvest started around 2000 2001 yeah it's for some of the other southeastern states it's, it's you know it's kicked forward about six to eight years given you know give or take there's some differences but now everybody's kind of trending downward or they've kind of stabilized with increasing hunter effort okay so there's yeah. more people there's more activity focused on the bird but the harvest is kind of stable well that <laughs> kind of tells you there's you know there's effort usually kills birds right well if you've got more effort and you don't have any increase in harvest then i mean it kind of tells you that you you have an issue there yeah so just lay it out for us what is the whole like what's the overview of the project on this wma like what are what are your goals and what it, what are you doing and then we'll go out there and look at right. the individual okay. stuff and learn more about it because i'm a layman yeah, yes, sure. So the bottom line with this work is we, we being the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife Resources Division, they are trying to get information on turkey populations in the Piedmont of Georgia, which is where we are. Given the recent declines we've seen in, in abundance and productivity across the south, which has also affected this part of, of Georgia, the agency's trying to understand what factors are influencing those declines and then what do, what do they do about it. So this study, which is now in its fifth year, is work that's focused on 
really two primary things. One is providing the agency with detailed assessments of gobbling activity. And that's what you're using the song that's meters the for. That's right. That's, that's what right. we'll go look yep. at in a little bit. Yep. So the gobbling activity, as, as you know, as a turkey hunter, gobbling activity is a primary determinant of hunter satisfaction. Yeah. So we want to oh, yeah. hear birds, right? So the, the agency is, is keenly interested in trying to make sure that season frameworks are set in a way where folks are going to hear birds gobbling. But we also know that gobbling activity is affected by things such as, as hunting activity, hen reproductive behaviors. So we're also trying to link the gobbling data to these other things that we're measuring right. at the population level. So that's one aspect. The second would be just a really keen focus on reproduction in, in this bird. Nest success. And you're tracking hens to yes, do that. Yes, that's primarily what we're, as far as the, the, the tracking we're doing is primarily hens. We do gotcha. track some toms as well, but it's mostly hens. And the idea is simple. You, you put these GPS units on, on the bird. They wear it like a backpack. It collects locations every hour as well as a roost location every night. So we know where these birds are spending time. We know where they nest. We know when they start nesting. We know when they start laying. So we can track that. We know when they hatch or when they fail, we can find the nest quickly and figure out what the cause of failure was. And then if they're lucky enough to hatch, which most don't, but the ones that are lucky enough, we can track those broods and figure out where those hens are taking their broods. What's the habitat structure there? Is there a way that we could create other areas on this landscape that are attractive for brooding? Sure. Um, that's the type of information that the agency is looking for. And then ultimately, what we hope to be able to do is to provide the agency with a model for trying to predict, okay, what's, here's what we have now. Here's what we're looking at right now in 2021. Where are we going to be in 2030, 2035, 2040, moving down the road? Sure. And how do you know if a, if a hen has failed? Well, you see, like, the, the pack won't move for a period of time if she's gotten, you know, killed or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so basically, or? as you can imagine, like, so she's wearing this GPS unit, and it's collecting a location every hour. So sure. there's a little bit of wobble in the data, if you will. There's about a, you know, a, an eight to 10 meter accuracy, give or take. So there's a cluster of points on a map that's, I mean, super clustered. Right. And we just assume that she's, she's in the center of that. Right. And when you get there, these folks, I mean, they're working their tails off. They're downloading data from these units constantly. And that allows them to understand, okay, well, she's here. She's right. been here for 14 days. Now, suddenly, she's gone. Okay. Well, sure. she failed. Plug it into a handheld GPS unit, the coordinate for the center of that cluster, and you walk to that spot. And usually, you're within some short distance. Yeah, of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you walk sometimes right up to it, and other times, you, you've got to hunt around for it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah, I got you. But that's that allows us to figure out nest fate. So if she leaves the nest prematurely, which for a wild turkey would be prior to about 27 or 28 days, usually something is up and you can locate the nest as quickly as possible. Then you can determine if it's a yeah. successful or unsuccessful. Yep. So yeah. if the eggs are you know, yep. pipped or not. Gotcha. And sometimes if it's confusing, we'll go out and do the brood check anyways, yep. like, you know, just to make sure, like, hey, we're not exactly sure the nest looked like it you know, could be successful, could be failed, but that window's short if it happens yeah. to be. Like, if it fails on, like, day 26 or something, then you're kind of like, well, we better go out the next morning and yep. yeah. see if she's got then the, you're the basically, yeah, yeah, Then you're yeah. basically turkey hunting without a gun. Right. That's <laughs> I was gonna, that's yeah, what I was gonna yeah, ask you. You get in that, underneath you, them early in the morning. Right. Yeah. See if she's on the ground, and if yeah. she is, then almost assuredly she she's has a, a brood with her. Nice. Uh, versus roosted in a tree. So sweet. So that that work starts. You know, we start trapping in January, and I say we they start trapping in January, and they're at it constantly until you know the first of March. We're in this period now where. You know, it's constant data downloads, trying to figure out when these birds start laying and incubating, because then you're keeping a constant eye on all of your sample of hens. When is that time frame for around here? Well, is it right now? We literally just saw the kind of explosion, so yeah. we had all of our hens together on they're, our other study site, and they were the really all week, balled up. And then yeah, we had they just scattered. We everywhere. had two distinct groups of hens that were on top of each other and like we went out on Saturday and they all expecting it to be nice and easy like it has been and then just poof 
Yeah. Everyone's all alone and yeah. separated. Anybody now. laying yet? Because it's getting there's, to be about that time. Acting like, like it. it. Yeah. yeah peaks no. for this area. Yeah. What we've seen in the previous four years, and for Mark and South Georgia, just before this study, is typically around the first week of April. You see a huge pulse in laying activity, and then our peak in incubation is around April fifteenth. Yeah. In most years. Okay. Some years it may be a little early. Some years it's quite a bit later. Our peak may be April 20th or April 22nd. So the bottom line is they're they're doing what they're supposed to do right now. They're you know they're starting to get in their laying sequence and what Sarah and Nick were saying. You know these birds have been in these social groups that we caught them in in the winter. It's like a fish net cast across like a cast net they go from the center of the net and they just go blowing Boom. outwards and, and that's when you start seeing hens in like the road ditch here's yep. a, yeah. here's yeah. a stray one, one here, here. yeah yeah and yep. what they're doing there is they're still social while they're laying right but they they're not as social because they again they, they parasitize each other yeah and we know that turkeys uh from captive research many years ago they don't like to be around other birds when they're approaching their nest site. So we think there's probably almost some like reconnaissance going on where these birds will separate from each other and kind of hang around and make sure that nobody's following me type of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then go lay their, their egg and their clutch and then go back a lot of times and start associating with those hens that, they were, that they've been with. So you kind of sure. see them kind of ebbing and flowing away from each other, which is pretty typical for for females and then as you know once they start incubating they're you know they're alone that right that, right that laying time coordinates pretty pretty good for most years with our gobbling activity too mm -hmm. so you see a pretty good peak once they once they start laying gobbling activity going yeah. up mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that yeah. we and that makes sense i mean you've got you've got a lot of competition at that time hens are entering into their laying sequence they're still fertile so there's a lot of breeding still going on while an individual hen is laying because um, because she's still fertile, but that period is starting to come to an end. As soon mm -hmm. as she starts incubating, she's not receptive anymore. Right. So these, I mean, and that's they, when they're... the toms know it. Right. I mean, um, so there's there's incentive to gobble at that point because sure. your window of time is running short. You know, if you're going to breed. So now this is a uh, this is just uh, speculation on my part. But what we were just at in, you know, southern Alabama, it was warmer, it was greener. Are they laying earlier there than they are here in it, some cases? It's very, it, there's very, a little difference. But little not difference, much. but I mean, not We're much. literally talking a couple of days. It's difference. based on photo period more than. Yeah, it, well, it's a photo period driven process, but there's latitudinal variation. Okay. So yeah. as you go from south to north, you'd expect it to be a little right. later but within a, a state the size of georgia or alabama you literally are talking a few days from sure. south to north Makes it's not sense. it's not dramatic now from here to say kentucky or virginia you know, yeah you'll see a you know several week variation between right here and there but not within a state the size of georgia sure makes sense let's go out and check out some of the details <laughs> sounds good i want to see one of these song meters sure, yeah <laughs> <laughs> Get em. let's do it yeah yeah, so basically what we have here is this is one of the, the they're called autonomous recording devices. Basically these, these we call them song meters, and that's what that green box is. The CC is just the study area. We're on Cedar Creek Wildlife Management Area, and, and we label each one with a number. So basically what, what we're doing is we're putting the tracking devices up high enough to where hunters or folks that are out and about don't disturb them or we try to minimize that and inside of that box there's batteries and there's an sd card where like trail camera kind of yeah it's like basically like a trail camera for audio sure 128 yeah. gigabytes worth of memory so yeah, yeah so then you've yeah. got this coaxial cable that goes up the tree and up 30 feet up uh, you may be able to see it on the right hand side of the tree. You'll see an external antenna coming out. On the south side. Yeah, on the right here. Can you see oh, the yeah. It's going around. Yeah, it's about 30 foot up. And what we're doing that for is to put the microphone up above the, the mid story vegetation that's here because what we're trying to do is, so it's called sound attenuation, this notion that a bird's on the ground, he's gobbling, or even in the tree, he's gobbling that gobble is carrying through the environment and it's being ripped up by all the stuff that's around it. 
So by getting the, the antenna up higher, you reduce that uh, so we can get extended range from the, from the external antenna. We can hear birds farther. So that's why we do that. So what the, the graduate students do is every few weeks, they come in and they download, uh, basically take the SD card out, change the batteries, take the SD card back, download the data onto external drives and do that from March 1 until June 30. And you end up with literally terabytes of data. Sure. It, it's a, because what these things do is they record all ambient sound. So every sound in the environment is on that SD card, whether it be a turkey or a cardinal or a crow or an owl or whatever it is. Then what we do is we take the, the data at the end of the season and we run it through, essentially, it's called a convolutional neural network. It's basically machine learning, if you ever know what machine learning is. Basically, we, you train it to identify what a gobble is. And this is new, right? You, you were telling me. Yeah, we that, just developed so you guys this. Didn't yeah, use we that. just developed it. This is the first year we've yeah. we've yep. implemented that. We used to use a, a program called Raven Pro, which is through Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and it what it did was go in and say like a gobble happens 700 to 1250 hertz, like on a spectrogram. Okay. So it would go in and it would pull out every single sound from that range. And what you would end up with is all sorts of noises, crows, I mean, owls, anything that falls within that range, it would pull it out. But when you looked at it on the spectrogram, it has, a, you know, a gobble's got a certain, like what we call sound signature. It kind of looks like a sideways triangle where it, it fires off first and you get this, this peak from 700 to 1200 hertz and then it kind of tails off mm -hmm. towards the end. Um, so what the what Mike was talking about the neural network what it does it actually looks at the pictures so it's kind of like you know, with the trail cameras how they've got them sorting out deer like mm -hmm. it, it's it's essentially doing the same thing we, I just trained it well I had some help but we we <laughs> trained it to recognize that picture and so now it pulls it out but like using the old software we'd get like 1.6 million detections of which like 30,000 would be gobbles the new stuff we get like let's say 250,000 detections of like 60,000 gobbles. So like our gotcha. time, so essentially it would take us, a, it used to take us a year to process mm -hmm. one season's worth. This past year, I processed everything we've ever collected from 2014 to 2018. So like we, we've essentially now, once we get the data, I'll put it into the neural network and within a month or two after after the season's done, we'll have results. You know, yeah, we'll have it's the been tabular. absolutely game changing. So what the, the neural network does one it's more efficient at detecting efficient. sounds in general that could be a gobble and it's better at teasing out i mean it, we're getting more gobbles and yeah. we're getting less work yeah i think a little bit more it picks them up a little bit farther yeah. i yeah. think than the old the old software did a little faint gobbles which the range we we typically uh derek colbert a study that you guys did back in what 2015 mm -hmm. found and he played recordings of a turkey he had it on like a a fox pro and went out and checked distances and where the software and it was like 205 meters i think or something yeah. like right around a tenth of a mile i would beg to say that we've gained quite half of that yeah, probably with the new and it also depends on where you're at like here you know our topography is relatively flat we're in the piney woods like the distance here is probably going to be a little bit less than say if i was on one of those ridges like you were on this morning yeah, where it's yeah, wide open here. like yeah. our range is yeah. you know where when you got that the microphone is actually above the, uh, the sure. upper story, you know, where they're roosted, then I think we get a lot. Yeah, a one thing range. you'll see in these Piedmont forests too, and, and you'll obviously have seen this driving around is, you know, prescribed fire. If it's implemented in these stands, you tend to see that the mid story is a lot shorter. It's not as thick as this is. So in certain open, more open stands, more, you know, like Patrick was saying, where the topography lends itself, you get quite a bit more distance sure. from the, the microphone than you normally would. So it really just depends on the terrain and, and the vegetation. But when it's fairly open, I think we're getting, I mean, pretty good, pretty good information. I think the most intriguing part of the of these devices is what you guys have done on the, those private land studies, or like you, what you would say um is a controlled site where there's no hunting no, no hunting, hunting. Yeah. yeah no hunting and then you have it out here on public land which this wma opens saturday is that saturday. what y'all were yep. saying yeah. mm -hmm. so yep. you guys have drawn some pretty unique observations yeah, looking at that data it's, it's pretty you? clear i mean hunting activity particularly heavy pressure like you see on this site yeah 
dramatically reduces gobbling activity relative to non-hunted Does sites. that happen like immediately or does it take it a day or so? I would say that? even a little bit more than a day or so to speak. Okay. I mean, what we see is about, I would say, 10 to 12 days mm -hmm. to, I mean, it starts dropping immediately. Okay, like, but you got to talk about like down. what kind of magnitude, right? Like it starts instead of trending upwards, the season opens and it will start going down. But as far as where does it hit like it's lowest that we're probably going to see, I would say it's about two weeks after the season open yeah. up. And that that's coincides with your harvest too, right? Like on yeah. these places, your cumulative harvest is going to be within that first week, you know, mm -hmm. what is it like? 70 percent of the yeah, birds most, are... most birds are killed within the first two weeks of, and really the first week and a half or so patrick just said something that's an important point you know on these sites particularly for the work i'm doing here in the south gobbling is supposed to be trending upwards well into april because hens are just starting to incubate or go to nest yeah right that's right, right. so yeah, right? You, so you should see a lot of gobbling activity and it should be really ramping up as late march early april on into the middle of april and it's it doesn't on these heavily hunted sites it, it trends upward till whenever that opening date is and then and it, whenever that opening date is it doesn't matter whether it's the end of march or the first of april that's when you start seeing it trend downward so there's it's a very clear signal between hunting even when you only have you know a, a lot less hunting pressure there's still a signal there it's right. just not as dramatic as what you'd see on like on here where you're getting yeah. a ton of people yeah. coming in yeah in a short period of time yeah and, these and that side, goes back to like hunter monitoring hunter satisfaction yeah was like yeah hunters are usually they're not necessarily you're measuring satisfaction by the amount of birds heard sure so a hunter feels like they're satisfied if they go on a hunt and they hear a turkey call sure yeah, and, and that hunter satisfaction as that that meter starts to drop is also <laughs> going to drop in that two weeks yeah. so and it's very clear when you when you when you talk to hunters that use this site and other sites that, that i've worked on that were heavily hunted when they see i mean we're turkey hunters we yeah. you know you guys have been out you you've seen the lack of gobbling activity oh, yeah. seasons have been ongoing for a bit here i mean the hunters will tell you these song meters are a pretty accurate reflection of their experiences I mean, <laughs> it's not like we're not hearing anything and it's been gangbusters for everybody else sure. I mean, they and they are frustrated which is part of why we're doing the work frankly i mean they you know hunters we we've expressed those frustrations to the state agencies and the agencies respond by doing this type of research so that they can maintain sustainable mm -hmm. populations of the bird and ensure that we're happy with our experiences doing that and as we talked about before that's a tricky balance and it doesn't always work out but that that's the agency's goal because they need us to be out there they need us yeah. to be in the field and hunters have to pay by well, we're the economic I mean, engine that drives this yeah. ship you know so so they want us to be a field but they also want to make sure we're satisfied and more importantly they want to make sure that the, the resource is sustainable and that all requires kind of a you know, a tightrope walk, if you will, mm -hmm. from the agency's perspective. Well, as far as using this and measuring the effect that hunting pressure has, it's real cool, real unique. Yep. And and it, like you touched on a minute ago, it, the process has gotten way more efficient for you guys yep. now. Yep. So this may be something you can replicate other places. Yes, absolutely. And we have, we've got, we've got the unhunted site, which is in South Carolina, which is the Savannah River site. We did four years at uh, Webb Wildlife Management Area in South Carolina and then we've got we're on are we on year four or five, five here five, now? Yeah. year five yep. here um, so we've got it already on a, a good bit of sites in the southeast we have a small subset from Louisiana yeah. the bottom line is until we developed this neural network it was valuable but it was so time prohibitive that sounds like it yeah that it you know we were providing the agencies time, yeah we were providing time. agencies with information a year after the fact if not longer uh -huh. it you know, I had an army of undergraduate students that worked for me that, 10 to 12. you know, that were constantly <laughs> doing this stuff. And now, you know, we can process this, this information very quickly, which now opens the door for being able to do this at a much broader scale. You still have to have man or woman power. You still have to have people that are, can be in the field like, you know, the graduate students are. But the time associated with doing this is now dramatically less than it was just a few months sure. ago. So I think now we're in a position where we could use this technology to capture gobbling activity at a much broader spatial scale, which frankly is what I think every agency in, in the country, but particularly the Southeast, would want to have that information. Oh yeah. Because even if they don't have it and they've never had it in their own state, 
that is a piece of information that you can take to a hunter and say, hey, here's what it looks like in my state mm -hmm. on these different sites that are exposed maybe to different hunting pressures or whatever. Um, and you can use it to inform your public. And what I've noticed through my own work, turkey hunters, we're, <laughs> we're a pretty passionate group. Oh yeah. Um, and we cherish being able to chase this bird, but we're also information starved. Like you want information, you want information, you want information, and that's information. Yeah. Having gobbling activity in your state at a, at a scale that means something to you, to me, as a turkey hunter, particularly given what you what you focus on, which is traveling and experiencing new places and seeing birds in different environments, having some a priori knowledge of, hey, here's what the gobbling activity looks like in this state, to me, would be invaluable. Oh, yeah. You can have uh, an expectation that, that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, your, your expectations are reasonable. You know, if you were interested in traveling to different places and you wanted to understand, hey, here's what the playing field's going to look like this week, this week on these different sites, and you had that some type of information, it would be it would be valuable. You're always going to be hamstrung by the fact that, you know, the gobbling data on this particular site is a reflection of this site, mm -hmm. the turkey density, the male harvest, the hunter effort, and it's always going to vary sure. across sites. But to what we were talking about earlier, and this is why, this is where it gets into like hunter opinion, you know, and a lot of you guys watching this feel the same way, but we see the same thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, but when you guys do it and you actually put numbers to paper, then you can take that to the state agency that manages the bird. Mm -hmm. Then we can move forward. We can make progress. Versus us yeah. just being like, versus us just being like, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, you know? exactly. Okay. yeah. Maybe you should die harder. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, they want to do stuff, mm -hmm. you know. The agencies do, and they want to. I like you said, they want people in the field. They want turkeys to hunt. They, yep. they want all those things. They want the same thing we do. Yeah, you also so have, have to understand, have to you know, from the agency's perspectives, you know, they have a certain amount of money that they can allocate right. to wildlife research, and depending on the state that you're in, you know, turkeys may not be. <gasps> you know, sure. I guess to say this, they may not be the priority. Mm -hmm. you know, there may be other brush fires that are oh, at the yeah. top of the agenda and turkeys are number four or five. And what you realize with the type of work that we're doing here, it, it's costly. It, it costs mm -hmm. money. These things, that setup is about $1,000, about, about 1050 bucks for that setup. You have to buy batteries, you have to buy SD cards, you have to have people that are willing to go you know, collect the information and process it. The GPS units and the other equipment that we're using, I mean, they're over a thousand dollars per unit. So right. this stuff costs money. And the sad part, reality is that the students actually are the, the least expensive part of the project mm -hmm. because we can only pay graduate students a certain amount of money, which is, which is, well, we won't go there, <laughs> but it's ridiculous. But that's the, the reality that we work under in academics. So we can only pay these folks a certain amount of money. So a lot of the money is just in the consumable, you know, like these supplies that go out in the environment or go on the bird's back. It's costly. But when you break it down, some of this stuff doesn't, is not really that costly for what you get out of it. So like these song meters last for years. Mm -hmm. And the company that, that manufactures them has an excellent warranty. If, they, if there's a defect or something, they replace the unit, uh, often just for the cost of shipping. So bottom line is some of this stuff, once it's purchased, can be used, you know, for a number of years. Yeah, over a bunch and over. of different environments. Exactly. A bunch exactly. of different situations. Yeah. yeah, and those are actually used to collect data on all source of vocalizations from a number of different species. We, we let the uh, quail lab at the university yeah. borrow them during the off season and they're you know counting covey counts and calls yeah. on them so and stuff these like things that. are actually used bats and stuff really yeah bats yep. we don't yep. do any we particular don't do bat work those <laughs> actual <laughs> units right there are used about eight months a year oh yeah. wow continuously and they they're you know they're like the energizer bunny they're that's a quality <laughs> quality product i mean nice so one of the biggest unknowns in the turkey world is how many of the damn things are out there right mm -hmm. yeah and i was just reading a book written in the 1970s earlier this morning the researcher who's a famous researcher named lovett williams he said we don't have many we don't know how many turkeys are out there we're in 2021 and we still don't know how many turkeys yeah. are out there and he actually says in this book he said you know until we figure this out we're going to be hamstrung forever mm -hmm. and my gosh you know Makes 40 sense. 
almost 50 years later, we still don't know how many turkeys are out there. And there's a reason for that. It's hard to figure that out. It's hard to estimate turkey abundance at a broad scale because they live in weird places. So like, you know, you can't, you don't just drive around Georgia and see turkeys everywhere. You know, Rios and Merriams and Goulds that live in more open environments, you can do a little bit better job of counting them, but you still, it's, it's coarse at best. Well, Easterns and Osceolas, they live in areas you can't see them. So one of the, the ways that we're trying to estimate abundance is when we catch these birds, we put colored leg bands on them. And each color sequence has like, so this bird would get two bands. One would be white, one would be blue, right? So basically each bird can be identified based on a photograph. Make basically sure. like running trail cameras for deer, yeah. right? Sure. You're, you're, you're looking at this deer's antlers and you're going Those to get- Those are the antlers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's, that's sense, buck yeah. number six or whatever it is. Yeah. That's that eight point with a kicker on his right G2 and whatever. Well, that's exactly what these bands are providing us. So we have trail cameras all over our study site. We're getting pictures of these birds, but we also have the, the, the more critical piece of information is we have GPS data on these birds. So these same birds are carrying GPS units. So we, not only do we know if we get a picture of them or not, but we know where they are. And that allows you to create a detection probability. In other words, we knew the bird was there, but we didn't get her picture. Or we knew the bird was there and we got two pictures, three pictures, five pictures, whatever. That allows us to model that mm -hmm. and get a good idea of the variation because of the spatial data that the GPS allows us. Right. So we're only in the second year of this. Yeah, this yeah. is the second yeah. season we've done this. And we don't do this on all of our study sites, but, but we're, we're about to. Um, yeah. <laughs> most of our sites will now, will now be doing this. Um, it's a bit more of a pain because, you know, one thing that we try to do with turkeys is you shoot a rocket net over this bird, it's not an enjoyable experience for them. I mean, it's not like they want to be caught. Stresses it's, the bird. It's a, it's a stressful situation. So we try our best to minimize the amount of time that we have these birds in hand. As you tack on all these additional things, such as collecting blood, so, like we talked about, mm -hmm. such as putting two bands instead of one, or whatever it is, that all adds up to more time in hand. So we're kind of in this tricky situation where we don't, we want to let them go as quickly as possible, but the, the net information gained from this is worth the extra time. And it's not going to happen overnight. It, I mean, it'll take years for us of continuously doing this to finally look at Georgia DNR and say, here's your density of turkeys on these study sites. Uh, it's not a one year type situation. So we know that, like we talked about earlier, this project's funded as of right now through 2026. In 2026, we, we will be able to tell the state, here's your density of birds on these sites. Yeah, and then they can make decisions. Yeah, because then, then what you have is you know how many turkeys are out there. Yeah. You know what the gobbling data looks like with a known number of birds. You know what the reproduction looks like. You know what your nest success looks like. You yeah, know. and that's what we're going to go look at in a yeah. minute. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So from the GPS data, yeah. you can now tell the agency, well, not only do we know we have this many birds, but here's what the gobbling data looks like with this many birds. Here's what your harvest looks like with this many birds. So your harvest rate or the percentage of your times that you kill now suddenly is a lot more meaningful because you know how many times are actually out there to be harvested. Sure. Then you pair that with the nesting data and you know, well, given how many birds are in this population, how many are we producing every year? And I think what you're probably going to see is what we know just from common sense is we're not making enough turkeys. Yeah. Uh, our populations from a density perspective are lower than we want them to be. And part of that is we're just not making birds. We're not producing birds in the spring and summer like we did 20 years ago. And then the question but, becomes, then what do we do about it? Right. Yeah. But like you said, you have to have the data to prove that. Yeah, the, the, the agency can't walk that, into a legislator's office can. and say, we need to make, we need to do X, Y, and Z without some type of information. If they do, they're, they're going to be beat up in the public press, as, as we all know. Yeah. So agencies are trying to do due diligence and having data to walk into someone's office and say, see, this is what we're dealing with here. Mm -hmm. Some agencies don't have any of that information. Right. And and that's a tough sled for them. You got to crawl states, before you can walk. Yeah, other states yeah. like Georgia, 
you know, South Carolina's done a lot of turkey research. North Carolina, Florida's done a lot of work. Alabama just recently completed a long-term, a five-year study. So there, you know, Texas, Louisiana, there, there are places where there are growing data sets, but there are also other states that really don't have a tremendous amount of turkey data, if at all, beyond just kind of these broad hunter survey type you know, data sets that are collected right. at a big scale. So what we're trying to do is provide this particular agency with the most precise information that we can. And what you all are doing every day is you're monitoring these hens out here. Yep. How many of those do you have with radio? Hens, we have hens. We have 36 six. this year. On this on this WMA? This uh, split between here, this between here area. and the next okay. area. Yeah. Gotcha. And that's, we, we try, depending on the site, we try to get at least 30 hens. Okay. on most of our sites that always doesn't work out sure. you know, <laughs> yeah. the turkey trapping gods yeah. frown on you um, sometimes we go way over and we actually start shifting gps from one site to another because we're having a lot of luck somewhere and not as much luck somewhere else right the bottom line is we're trying to get about 30 hens 10 ish toms and in some sites we may get 40 or 50 hens and 20 toms it just that depends on how much money the agency is willing sure. to, to put into the to the research. Yeah, so they're, the gear, yeah. Yeah, they're out here constantly tracking, which is a grind. It sounds sexy and romantic, but it's, <laughs> that part is over with for the year. <laughs> <laughs> the romantic part is actually catching the bird and putting Having stuff. Yeah, yeah, and like, oh, finally yeah. got you. you know? yeah. Yeah. And then you let them go. It's like, I'll never see you again <laughs> <laughs> until you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping I see a couple of them in a week. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, so, yeah, we can show you the gear that they, they yeah. use to track the birds and everything. We got yeah. it over yeah. the truck. Yeah, that'd be sweet. So this is what we're actually tracking. This is what the turkeys are wearing. This is a unit we recovered last year after a bird got killed. Um, Ted has it, uh, or shot a bird in Missouri a few years ago yeah. that had a unit on it. Yep, he would have had a VHF unit. They look a little bit different than this, but it's essentially the same thing. So like we aren't actually listening to like the GPS beacon. All of these are equipped with a VHF. And so we use this receiver here to pick up and it's just like a pulse rate. And so that pulse rate actually tells us a lot of information. It kind of tells us how close we are to the bird. Um, it can tell us whether or not they're moving around because as the bird's pivoting and this antenna is going towards and away from you, it's kind of coming in and out, which drives you a little crazy because you're like, sure. stand still, please. <laughs> um, and then it also, when they've been inactive, I think ours are set to 18 hours. 18 hours, then a mortality signal. It's a different type of beep. Whenever you hear the beep, it'll just, pick up the pace a bit a faster pulse and rate. then you'll know that bird's either dead or it could show oh, that the female's incubating and sitting on the nest for a period of time yeah right right and these also have like an emergency mode will they like double beep and it's usually that it's supposed to mean that the unit's dying okay um and then we can't usually about a month later we can't track it anymore uh, sometimes they get stuck on emergency mode just because i mean you're sticking this out on a turkey. Right. <laughs> it, it has a pretty tough life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How long do those things last? About, uh, we're about a year. Yeah. Well, about a year. A yeah. year certainly for the VHF. Yeah. The GPS tapers off about eight, nine months. Yeah. But. And usually if you recapture them, you can send them off to the company and then yeah. they'll end up collecting. Recovering the data, the for, data us. for us. Or at least what it collected. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's unique about them is that VHF signal. That's how they used to do it back in, like you used to have yeah. to triangulate them to get your points and you had a certain window of error now these units are downloadable yeah. like we get within i think it's like 500 600 meters of the bird and i'm able to pull off all the gps points yep. for every hour and then sure. that roost point for all of them and it makes it so much easier with the vhf i mean you're kind of wandering around looking for the you've nest this you got a location error, yeah. you go to that nest and well sometimes it's easy depending on how <laughs> hidden they are yeah and we still do a little bit of like biangulation just kind of day to day because we're not downloading them every single time because we track them every day to every other day yeah. uh, every day when once they're started on a nest but uh, you just kind of usually get two points where you can hear the bird from so that way you can kind of tell if they're moving or not um whether or not they've they've jumped around yeah. it just helps to like with the big hardwood bottoms out here it's like okay well i know exactly where you're at and yeah. do you have any close yeah, we have, yeah we have two that were here this morning <laughs> so we'll so we've been standing here. here talking now so what's the uh, well, i can run you through this yeah yeah sure. we just flip it in each one has a unique uh vhf yeah. signal <laughs> and then each has a caller id so when you download it you can pick up which individual you're looking you. at yeah, yeah. 
So what number is it? We've got 272. This is what it looks like. I'm blocking the frequency column. But... Sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to say you can see the ID. It's the frequency is what we've got. 272? 272, yeah. So you just kind of make a circle around you and it'll kind of fade out. And then uh, where it's loudest, it's so about right there. Yeah. yeah. It's down in that bottom. But what you're able to do is you got a gain on this, you can adjust that. And you'll hear that signal real get weaker and you're able to pinpoint her much better. Because now I can't hear her back of me at all. How far away is it? Right she's not very close. Yeah, she's, she's probably she's not like too. three quarters of a mile at least. Yeah. Away. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, at least. Yeah, we definitely couldn't download her. Yeah, sure, we have sure. to move. Yeah, I can see why this is a time-consuming process. <laughs> <laughs> you literally got to go do that. Yeah. Every single bird, yeah. chasing We've them all got over. Got omni antennas that you can throw on the truck, which kind of helps, so you can flip it on while you're driving down the roads, you know, and then you'll you'll hear a beep and you'll you'll throw it in park and get out and then figure okay, out the direction. Go. So yeah, we also have, we have this big five. We have a five element. element that that allows you to get like it gives us a little bit more, more reach. Range. Yeah. yeah, we don't have to get as close to do the download sometimes, especially if we have like a nice high point. We definitely use the topography to our advantage. Yeah. Like I would never like stand in a hardwood bottom with this on a hen that's far away because it's going to come in from every single direction. Gotcha. So yeah. signal can bounce off of everything from the trucks yeah. to buildings to just Whenever like, it was loud bottoms. like that, you could still hear the beep kind of back right. that that's yeah. kind of bouncing around. And when you turn it down, you're able to get like more of a yeah. direction on mm -hmm. it. Sure. So that just comes in with practice. Yeah. I mean, once you do this for a while, you kind of learn like, okay, no, that's just bounce. She's actually this way. Yeah. Sometimes it even well, when, gets us. But. Yeah. Well, once you get down in some of those bottoms that have so much topography, I mean, it's yeah. just going everywhere and you're like, right. where the heck is this thing? Sure. <laughs> or you have like a bird that you feel like you're on top of and they're like, there must be like a piece of sheet metal that she's underneath. Cause I can't like, yeah. I can't pick her up. And then power lines are a whole different power story. Lines are a whole different yeah. Story. It just gets, you all said they're starting to, to, go off to nest right now and they just started a couple days ago you saw them just bust up so will it get easier to track them then in the once next couple weeks pens. as they start incubating once they start incubating yeah i mean as stay. long as she stays there once something depredates her nest She's it depends on what happened gone. to her sometimes she'll fly out of there i mean if you go there and she has some feathers around there and something actually got a hold of her but she's still alive they'll take off yeah. sometimes yeah we've sure. had birds go couple miles how many how many nests what's your nest success you know on average is that even a question yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. basically on our study sites on this study site it it has ranged anywhere from around 18 to about 28 29 percent the average across the southeast right now from east texas all the way over to north carolina on all of our sites is about 20 percent which means that about 80 percent of all nests fail as you go out into other areas like rios, rios are more precipitation driven. So in some years, there's it's literally 0% nest success in dry years. And in super wet years, you may see 50 plus percent nest success. So basically rios are kind of boom and bust. When it's boom, they make a lot of birds. And then when you, when you go up in like Merriam's, you see they tend to have pretty high nest success, 35 plus percent on average, but they, they live in a different, you know situation yeah like exactly that. so you have nest success but you also have winter mortalities that are important almost every year so you lose a segment of birds that we wouldn't lose in the south right. and we don't know with goulds goulds are the most poorly understood subspecies sure. for sure yeah is there a way that you measure then poults like after they after they hatch then you go out there and find them i think it's about every five days we'll go in initially we'll go in and we'll see if we're not sure if the nest was depredated or not we'll go in and we'll check and see if she has poults with her and from there it's till day about 10 14 10 14 they'll ground roost we have these transmitters set to come on at 5 a.m it's so much less invasive if you just walk in there in the morning and she's on the ground and not in a tree but then Day 14 on, it's actually pretty cool. You get the track in and you can see the little poults sitting in the trees. Yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. That's the best way to count them too. Yeah. Well, I mean, as soon as it gets daylight, they're in the grass. You're not yeah. gonna count yeah. them. Sometimes you hear them. Yeah. Yeah. We, try, we try not, there are ways you can estimate poult survival, like individual poult survival. 
but you have to go in and disrupt the brood right. and then mark the birds and i'm just i'm not a fan of that so what we we do is a little more it's a little more coarse in that we don't know exactly how many poults survive the first month and in some cases we do in some cases we'll see them and say okay she's still got four with her so four out of the 10 she hatched but most of the time we're just concerned with did she have a brood that made it to the end of the first month and then they start ended up and even before one month they end up in bunches you know they amalgamate with each other so you might have two or three hens that all have poults and it's hard to separate one from the other so we kind of in the turkey world we kind of think you know once they make it past the first month they're in pretty good shape and that's that's typically what you see is if they can get through the first really the first few weeks, you see survival dramatically increases as soon as they can roost off the ground. But certainly after a month, I mean, they're growing rapidly, you know, and after, you see turkeys as y'all are moving around. As they get a few months old, they're almost indistinguishable from the hens. So at that point, they're, we think things are pretty good, you know, from, from their perspective. The problem is there aren't many that make it to that, <laughs> to that stage, at least in the Southeast. Yeah, like we were saying a while ago, average is, right now are around two is that right and they've dropped, they've dropped. well the the yeah. the yeah. pulse per hen is is less than two in most in most states two. yeah and and within a brood the average brood size is about three to four so if you start doing kind of the math and you extrapolate from there you you have for every hen in the population that's observed there's about one and a half pulse out you know if you think about that from her perspective on, so you can't have a half of a poult, right? So one and a half poults on average is not even one surviving female being added into the population each year. Do you, does that make sense? You'd have to have two poults per hen to have a male and a female be in the population. So at less than two poults per hen, she's not replacing herself on average. Instead, what's happening is at least the female portion of the population is slowly declining and that's consistent that's with the data. Yeah. One thing that we see that's different and this is this could go down a rabbit hole so stop me guys if I go too wild here but I'm from Missouri. Our season comes in around the third week of April mm -hmm, mm -hmm. every year and it's designed to come in at around peak nesting or just over the peak. Yep. You can only you can harvest two birds in the state, but you can only shoot one turkey in the first seven days of the season. Right. Right. So that pushes, you know, harvest that spreads your harvest out a little bit more. And I had no I, I had no idea, but I was looking at like the harvest data in Alabama, for example. And I don't know what they killed last spring, but what is it like sixteen thousand, fifteen thousand? That's what the telecheck numbers, yeah. Yeah, yep. in Missouri they kill 50,000 yeah. birds a spring. And it's been that way for some time. And I know there's widespread declines down here in the south. I mean, that's why a lot of us come down here, mm -hmm. is to hunt yeah. early in the season before our seasons open up. But you can kill more turkeys down here. Yeah. You can kill more turkeys, but there's fewer turkeys killed mm -hmm. than well, there is up there. Well, you couple couple things. Yeah, that is a loaded, well, a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get it. <laughs> There are varying ways that states estimate kill. Some states, like Georgia, has a telecheck system where you're supposed to, you know, mm -hmm. register your bird within a certain time of you harvesting it. Some people do that and some people don't, right? Yeah. Georgia is really nice because we were talking about that last night. We were at the hotel yeah. because we could look at like the county by county yes. yeah. harvest yeah. data. We could even look at the individual WMA yep. harvest yep. data. Yeah. Yeah. So you can kind of track real time, you know, here's what the playing field looks like. Other states have different systems of doing it, and, and what you'll see is that most states will publish an estimated harvest. Okay. And what that is, is that's some combination of something they know and stuff they don't know. Right. So we know that there were X number killed. We do surveys, and now we predict that X number were actually killed. So they'll call it an estimated harvest. Okay. So yet. I would just say that to caution people that when you're looking at harvest data, uh, pay attention to that. If it's telecheck data or some tagging system, it's common sense to think you wouldn't call in a bird you didn't kill, mm -hmm. right? I mean, why would you register a bird that you didn't kill and, and not be able to actually harvest your bag limit? So right. in my eyes, that's kind of a known harvest. You know, we know that many birds have been taken. That's different from an estimated harvest that's based on surveys that hunters will 
will be asked to do after the after season. After the season, yeah. So there's some there's some gray areas in there. But sure. the bottom line, to your point with Missouri, Missouri based their season on, on the science. They're, they're one of the very few states in the southeast that's taken that pr- approach where they said, look, our nesting data suggests that this is the right time because we've known for, for decades that harvesting turkeys, the most conservative way to do that in the spring would be to time harvest of toms when hens are at the peak of their incubation. And the reason for that is simple. At that point, most breeding is, is finished and some segment of those toms is expendable. You can kill them without any impact to the population. So what Missouri did is said, look, this is what the data suggests in our state. And Missouri is blessed in many ways. One, your state has money. Well, and you've had some of the most extensive turkey research ever conducted yeah. Yeah. In, in your state. Yeah, Ted, you shot one of those research birds a few years ago. Yep. That was one of the birds I banded. Had to band. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I worked on that project. No. Banded that bird, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you look, well, it's pretty you. awesome. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you look at Missouri, so not the the current research aside, Missouri had what is widely still considered one of the the, the top turkey projects that's ever been conducted. That was done during the 1980s, and a lot of the knowledge that we have and have used for many years is based on that that work. So Missouri looked at their own data and said, "This is when we should open the season." And not only that, we're going to put this, the the one bird, the first seven day into this because we want to push, we want to give you opportunity. We want you to go hunt. We want you to buy that license and we want you to go out there and experience what what your passion is. But we also want to push a little bit of that harvest towards the tail end of the season and give that remaining little bit of breeding activity time to completely wrap up before we get that second Mm -hmm. slug of birds being killed. Right. South Carolina did the same thing. They they have a kind of a season within a season bag. Right. Arkansas recently altered their season. They took the approach of just timing it based on the peaks in incubation, um, and they they went a little bit different route. They you know you can't harvest jakes and so a lot of the states are considering you know how do we do this. Some are basing it solely on the science, which is, in my opinion, I'm biased because I'm a scientist. But that, <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, that's kind of, in a nutshell, that's the way I believe is, is that if you're going to make progress for hunters and for turkeys, you have to have the research. You have yeah. to have the science. I mean, that's how we got the birds introduced in the first place. You yeah. know, back in the, yeah. what was that, in the 70s and the 80s? Oh, I they, mean, we've been moving turkeys since 50s, 60s, okay, 70s. Okay, sure. Yeah. 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 Th- that's where it all starts is what you guys are doing. Unfortunately, you're not you're not in the political process because if you were, that would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the average turkey hunter can be part of the political process mm-hmm. because the people, the, the way regulations are set, science is often not, is not what's used. It's political pressures from, from us. Mm-hmm. that say I want to be out there earlier I want to I want to hunt birds when they're when they're gobbling they're going to gobble out they're going to be done so let's go hunt March 15th and and that's just reality and unfortunately you know we went through this boom with turkeys where we had birds being restored everywhere across the south and they were everything was good times were great and right under our noses those populations were already starting to decline we just didn't realize it so we went through this heyday where it almost seemed like you couldn't kill too many turkeys mm-hmm. so you saw states just liberalize their seasons give us more time uh, decision makers would cave to the political process and say well we've got this we've got this vocal person that wants the season to be moved earlier one week. We want the the youth opener to be one week early. We right. want these things, and there were plenty of turkeys to support that. Yep. And now we have a situation where we have declining populations. We have more hunter interest, which is that's a great thing. Like we've talked about, you need people interested, but you have to have a resource that's sustainable. And now you're seeing states that are like, well, wait a minute. The science has always suggested. The science hasn't changed. Right. The science has always suggested that the way to do this the most appropriately from a biological standpoint is to time your harvest when your hens are in pink incubation. And if you do that, again, you can kill some percentage of your toms and it's irrelevant. Dominant toms, it doesn't matter who it is because at that point, the breeding is, is pretty much complete for the year. And if, if, if 
you do have some limited copulation, some limited breeding. It's not all of your hens that are doing that. It's only a segment of your hens that are doing that, say for second or third nest if they lose their first. So the science has shown that for years. It's just that we collectively Oh, everybody, every turkey hunter we talk to, even amongst ourselves in our group, we've probably all got differing opinions on, like every state we go to is like, well, what is causing this problem in this state? It's like, well, it's this, or it's this, or it's this. But the, in reality, the only way to know is to do what you guys are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, yeah, and, yeah. and you know, the, I said this, I've said this before. I think it's, there's truth to it, or I wouldn't say it, but we as hunters, and I do, we do this in our day-to-day -day lives We're outside of hunting. We try to identify one thing mm -hmm. in all of our lives. And I, I just said this on a podcast recently. It was, I, I kind of look at this as a coach's view. So I try to look at, at, at turkeys from a coach's perspective. In other words, when we watch ball games, we focus on who has the ball. If we're watching football, it's who's throwing it or running it or catching it. If we're watching baseball, it's the pitcher and where it goes in the field. And what we don't realize is coaches, he or she, they stand there and they evaluate the entire playing field and they let their position coaches handle everything else. That job is so that they can see how everything is interacting together because their objective is to win the ball game. And I think as turkey hunters, we get too infatuated on watching the ball. And we need to take a bigger perspective and, and say, well, all of those positions on that field are important. They're all influencing turkeys, predation, habitat, disease, harvest, you name it. All of that's affecting turkeys. Every ball game is different. Defensive from back, state to exactly. State. Yeah. So every county ball game is different. Yeah. 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 So in this particular spot in the state, you might have some disease issues that are not problematic in the next county for whatever mm -hmm. reason. So if you, if you get caught on watching the ball, you're constantly chasing the ball. Yeah. If you look at it from the coach's perspective, then you see the big picture. And, I, and I, again, I have to force myself almost on a daily basis to do this. Because if you take that perspective, I think you realize that there's no smoking gun. There's no one thing. It's all these things that are interacting together. And, and it's all people really interacting together. I mean, sure. it was a tremendous yeah. effort for all those years to get those birds reintroduced to, to these places. You know, it, yeah. was a, it was a turkey, lot of and people. And turkey hunters drove that. Right. You know, um, you know, we, we all want the same thing collectively. We want to go out and hear turkeys and be mm -hmm. successful and have fun and spend time with our friends and family and whatever. But yeah. you got to have a sustainable population of birds to do that, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One other thing was the burning, wasn't it? that we wanted to touch on. Mm -hmm. and I guess we could touch on it real quick. <laughs> well, of course you did. Yeah. Here's the deal. I, we, we see this when we go and hunt places. Like where, where you find high habitat diversity, water, you know, in a creek bottom with a nice pretty hardwoods, mm -hmm. and then you have a burn section along the edge, especially in the south like this in some sort of an open area, clear cut or a little green field or something all right there in that one spot, there's turkeys. Yep. If you do, period. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. if, if you go walk out in the middle of a giant burn, you may not run into as many turkeys. That's because, exactly right. Or it doesn't have to be a burn. It could just open be the middle of a pine forest. Yeah. yeah. You know, they have to have these things. A mosaic. Yeah. It's right. right. So it's it's talking and I heard you talking uh, recently on that podcast you did with the fire guys yep. mm -hmm. um about small scale burning yep and and like this the scale of the burn is what's most important and man that makes so much sense just from hunter observation mm -hmm. yeah like you see turkeys using the edges of burns yeah and what the what the telemetry data clearly shows is these these birds when when a stand in their home range is burned they almost immediately go back to it most birds will reoccupy the stand within 48 hours. They, you don't displace the bird on the landscape. They come right back to it. And the reason they're doing that is simple. Fire desiccates insects. Yeah. And it, it allows everything that's laying there is just dead, but still forage. Right. So they're scarfing up things along the edges of these fires, but they don't look across a big, a larger fire and think, I want to walk over there. They stick to the escape cover that's on the outside. So we see about 250 yards. They use a, a band of about 250 yards around the edge. Where we killed that bird yesterday. Keep that in mind when you're hunting, guys. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's where I'm going with this. You know, we're yeah. always trying to help hunters, and where we were hunting out in Alabama, that's exactly where we killed that turkey yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and, 
as what, what we've seen is that as the scale gets larger and larger and larger, you see less and less use of the interior of the, of the fire. It takes months for them to just go back to that center. So if you kind of take a square or a rectangle and it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, at some point, you don't have turkey habitat anymore in the center. Your goal was to produce habitat, but in reality, what you've done is you've made a buffer around the outside that's turkey habitat, and everything else is not for the, for this season. Now, right. by next year, it's okay, it's good. The point being, scale matters. It's not just the timing of the fire, you know, whether you're February, March, April, or whatever, but it's how big it is. If you're willing to go smaller, that's better. But as you know, you've, you've driven around this state and others, agencies are in they're in this constant battle because some of them are working under federally mandated fuel load reductions right they, they have to burn and they have to burn a certain amount of acreage and they're doing it in a way that typically pushes the size of the fire larger sure yeah and because i mean they're trying to be efficient with their time and sure. the money and people yeah. they have limited you know yeah. man and woman power and they have limited money and they have limited burn days yeah and you yeah. stack all that together and it's like well three thousand acre burn certainly isn't ideal but that's what we're going to do and and of course hunters and i don't i get it i i, I don't blame hunters for being concerned about that because the science <laughs> suggests that that's not the best way to to manage the landscape for for this bird sure um the agencies are are in a tricky situation when it comes to fire as well I definitely, when we were in Alabama, though, we saw a lot of really good habitat. Like it was managed well. Oh, I mean, yeah. and there was Alabama. a lot of areas that were specifically managed for like quail yeah. and turkeys. And we saw quail and turkeys in those, in those yeah, areas. And see, and in, quail, in, in quail management, you are, you're thinking small scale. Mm -hmm. Because a Bob White's home range is tiny compared to a turkey. To a turkey, yeah. So you're thinking small scale to begin with, and you're thinking... A combination of dormant season fire which would be winter and growing season fire which would be right now mm -hmm. because you're trying to produce plant communities that are mostly herbaceous and forbaceous and not what you see around you which is mostly woody right so the earlier burns you tend to end up with habitat like this the later burns in this into the spring you tend to end up with more grasses and forbs and that's good for bob whites it's good for turkeys as well a common question i get like this time of year is well should i be burning last week well as i mean we've already talked about this our birds are just now starting to exhibit behavior that would say they're even laying a clutch and that's not all the birds so we're at the very early stages of nesting here in this part of georgia so your burn window in my opinion shouldn't have closed if you're concerned about the nesting season it, it could have closed just a few days ago. If you're burning at a small scale, think, you know, dozen acres, 20 acres, 30 acres, the chances of you disrupting a nest April 15th, yeah. Pretty slim on that. In a 30 acre block. In the grand scheme of things, I'd be willing to lose a nest just to, to create produce, more, better to produce, habitat. You know, 30 or 50 acres of habitat that's going to be sustainable and is going to be more productive than, than say that stand. Yeah. So you're in a you're in a trade-off. How many right? people does it take to do one of those small-scale burns? Uh, safely? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've done some with a drip torch and a tractor and, and yeah, and a backpack spray full of water. Yeah. Yeah, typically, sure. I mean, you want several people so that you have can have somebody monitoring the fire breaks. And bottom line is fire breaks are, I mean, obviously you have to have fire breaks. You have to right. have something that the fire yeah. can't get across. If you got a lot of fuel, you want to use backing fires, you yeah. know, to allow the fuel that's against your break to, to be consumed before a head fire comes through. And But a few people could manage a small Now, fire. I guess that's where I was kind of going with it was if you and, you know, your small group are interested in, you've obviously got to become a educated on how to do mm -hmm. this stuff is there a place where folks can get that information yeah on yeah how I mean, to do that or what it, what channels do they have to go through in order to yeah to either get a license to do it or talk to somebody that can help them do it or your first step would be your your state forestry commission okay so contact your state forestry commission and they will provide you with the either the assistance or the path for here's how you make this happen there's some legalities obviously involved with prescribed fire you know, whoever ignites that fire is responsible for the smoke and the, for the fire itself 
So the first step would be your, your state forestry commission. And then you can identify either ways of doing it yourself. If you were interested in being certified, there are, there, there's education, there's short courses that you can take to be certified. Sure. If you, if you don't, then just understand that again you're responsible, you're responsible. For, your, for your actions yeah <laughs> yeah otherwise you know they're they're consultants they're you know private consultants that do prescribed burning sure all over the place obviously there's some expense involved there but if you could kind of collaborate and coordinate with your forestry commission in many cases they will they will put the fire breaks in for you at no cost Oh, really? I didn't um, know that. And, and then all you have to do is arrange for the fire. Okay. In fact, like here in Georgia, there's a situation where the Forestry Commission will, they will not ignite the fire, but they will do everything but. So you have a situation where you get your fire breaks put in, you have monitoring on site, but you have to ignite the fire. So there, there are resources out there for, for private landowners to do prescribed burning with very little cost to themselves and dramatically reduce liability because of all the outside assistance you can get basically for free. I mean, in these, in these pine dominated communities where we're standing, if you don't burn those, you don't have turkey habitat. Mm -hmm. you, you have at best marginal habitat for a variety of species, not just turkeys. But when you use prescribed fire, and more importantly, when you use a return interval, meaning you return fire on a consistent basis to that stand every few years. You end up shifting the plant community away from, say, this is sweet gum, woody dominated stuff behind us. That's not ideal turkey habitat. They'll deal with it, but they're not going to be as successful as they're going to be in a well-managed fire-driven landscape. Mm -hmm. So in the south here where we're at, fire and turkeys are, are joined at the hip. Right, right. And, and without it, especially in like a stand like this, if you know if this doesn't get burned in the next what five years, the turkey's not passing through yeah. through it yeah, either. Yeah, so like yeah. for yeah. like the hunters, you know, they get frustrated with the burns out here, which it's easy to do, especially these large scales. But at the same time, it's like, but if we didn't have that fire at all, like then yeah, think about what this this yeah. it, it becomes yeah. something where it's vacant vacant on you know for a very short period of time, but then if you don't you let it go then you just have nothing like it's yeah. a hole like we we've got places where we have gps birds and where there's certain whether it's on private property and the landowner doesn't burn it or whatever and you you'll see the gps points will literally just surround an area and you'll look at me be like well what's what's that what you can go there and it's this pine stand that, like, you, 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 you can't yeah. even walk through it so then it becomes just a hole on the landscape correct me if i'm wrong but like places like out west where drier climate when they don't burn or when they make burn you know they try to not let stuff burn that's just building fuel yes. which makes fires way worse so yeah. like a small scale prescribed burns are better than oh, no absolutely. burns at all because then all of a sudden you've got fuel and then yeah. things get out of hand yeah and what we've seen we've actually been fortuitous we've had turkeys marked we had one a group marked in texas when a wildfire just exploded the Possum Kingdom fire back in, I don't recall the year, but it, the, the fire scar was what you see out west. Mm -hmm. It was, there was a complete reduction of canopy in some of that parts of that scar. And turkeys stopped using it and did not resume using it because right. the, the trees were gone. Sure. So, you know, when you see these catastrophic wildfires, they can't always be prevented from prescribed burning, but re reductions in basal area which is tree density how many trees are standing there and reductions in fuel load that's how you prevent those issues yeah. and that you know wildfires wildlife you know species in general or many of them are resilient and they can recover from situations like that but when you've got a bird that sleeps in a tree and the trees disappear trees down that's problematic yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean yeah. there's places in colorado where You'd think there'd be turkeys, but there's places that are just, I mean, the trees have been gone yeah. for years. Yeah. And they're not there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You actually, that's one of the bigger problems facing rios in certain areas is the loss of roost habitat. Right. I mean, and when you start getting up in the panhandle of Texas and into Oklahoma and, and Kansas and you look at the loss of cottonwoods, cottonwoods. Yeah. it's it's dramatic. Um, and turkeys. What's the reason for the loss of cottonwoods? There's a, it just people? No, there's there's disease issues, um, and basically cottonwoods are they're a riparian type species right. out there. So once they're gone, how do you get them? I mean, they're gone, right? So 
Um, what you see, like in the, in the south, you can grow cottonwoods almost anywhere here because the soils are wet enough, we, we can do that. But out west, it's, it's not that case. So you, you, you basically have the loss of cottonwoods where you've got these riparian zones that have turkeys. And then there's not just all cottonwoods, there's a particular one that mm -hmm. these birds are using. And there's one right down the road that for whatever reason they don't use. And when you get rid of the one, you'd think they just go to the other one and they don't do that. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Um, Anyway, that's Rio moral, specific. Moral of the story is that if you're a turkey hunter, wherever you live, you need to get up on habitat. You know, you need to learn about trapping in your area. Yeah. Which Edu <coughs> educating you guys did on these things. Too. You guys did yeah, a podcast important. on predators and trapping mm -hmm. and stuff. So we don't have to go in all that on this video. We'll just link to that podcast where you guys can go and listen to it. But I mean, I know that's that's my issue. When I travel to all these different states, I know more about my home in yeah, Missouri but sure. whenever I'm traveling to these different states we've hunted what three four different environments in the last oh, three yeah. weeks yeah I mean this is totally different than where we just came from yeah, it's yeah. Not if you go to the mountains fun. you know two yeah. hours up the road it's going to be completely different <laughs> than the Piedmonts so, yeah. well we've taken enough of y'all's time I think we ought to let you guys get back to work what y'all are doing is way more important than what we're doing today which is just no, lounging what you're around. doing is, is going to educate people <laughs> yeah. about what's going on and communication yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, a year ago, nobody would have done that. So, hey man, there's value that's, in it. That's what we want people to know. Yeah. I, I certainly want to know about it all. So I, I would hope that I other think folks most would too. most you know turkey hunters. You don't see a lot of people just dabble in turkey hunting anymore. They yeah. they get pretty serious. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and the ones that are that have been doing it for more than just a couple of years, particularly the folks I interact with, the calls I get are usually not from your demographic. Um, it's usually from people that are my age mm -hmm. that have seen 30 years plus mm -hmm. of this and they're like, we got a problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, we got well, a lot of new hunters that are, that are coming on. A lot of you guys watching are new, you know, yeah. even new turkey yeah. hunters that just started in the last couple of years. I've been and, turkey hunting basically my whole life. And like, you know, if, if I didn't know any better from people that have been hunting longer i would be like oh this is great yeah, yeah. there's tur you know there's yeah. enough turkeys that we're hunting them across the country yeah. but if it's declining it's something that obviously needs yeah. to yeah the, the, the conversations i hear from the, the hunters that you know the folks that have been in even in the industry for 30 years and they you sit down and and they tell you what they saw 30 years ago or 25 oh, yeah. years ago and then what they're seeing now I have not had a single conversation where somebody said it's better. Mm -hmm. It's uniformly where we've got challenges facing us and we needed answers, you know, a decade ago. Not it's, and it's not like going to get harder too with the sprawl of cities, population of oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, people. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so I we mean, got to get said, our hands dirty. Said, is people, what you're saying. Nobody's making any stuff. more land either. And yeah. That's, yeah. You know, that's a yeah, and in, and in some places, you know, it's not so prevalent here where we're at in Georgia because this is a pretty rural area. But mm -hmm. as you drive around here, you just kind of pay attention to the number of houses that are stuck back in these these little parts of the world like we're standing in. And then you go somewhere like I just came from Florida where, mm -hmm. you know, the state of Florida, if you're an Osceola hunter, you need to be thinking about the loss of habitat mm -hmm. because southern Florida is disappearing into a suburban urban matrix right and a lot you, of the country is really yeah, I mean, you've got you know you've got a bird yes. that that's living down there that 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 frankly in many areas the osceolas are thriving but in other areas are not and, and you, you just, can look at a map from the last 30 yes. years and you can just mm -hmm. see you can just see like that florida yeah. doing yeah yeah it's just oh, it's, it's just terrible. shrinking around them and and to a lesser extent but it's just as problematic as if you look at the city of atlanta and you just go back 20 years ago and go to images on Google Earth or something, and you look at the, the footprint that, that Metro Atlanta had now compared to today. I mean, you know, 20 years ago compared to today, it's unbelievable. And all of that suburban sprawl is taking turkey habitat. Right. Um, yeah. And other species, yeah, not just turkeys. Yeah, in general. You know, so, yeah, we, we've got challenges ahead of us, and we're going to end up, I mean, we're going to have to all realize that we're going to be managing for this bird in less habitat every year forever. Mm -hmm. So, so we're, we have to do a better job you, with what exactly. we're doing. Exactly. You're gonna have yeah. to, we have to do better across the board with, with 
every little thing that we can impact positively, we better do it because we're not making any more land, we're not producing as, as many turkeys, and we're not going to. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do a better job with the footprint that we've got to work with, or otherwise, 10 years from now, the conversation's not going to be, well, how do we reverse this? It's going to be, well, now we're we're in a really tough situation. What do we do about it? Like we were right. talking about earlier, do we do you force states or, or, or states forced to, to make dramatic changes to their regulations like you see with some of your western big game species where there's so much demand and, and there's not enough resource to, to support that demand we got we got we got to change course before we get there yep that's yeah. right what yep. are a couple of quick things that come to mind that just anybody watching this can do this spring or even today that would help if there's anything that i, I every time i'm asked that i give the same answer if you are a turkey hunter pick one spot that you hunt, that you have a family member, a buddy, an acquaintance, whatever. Find one spot of land. If you own it, great. Yeah. If, you, if you're a landowner, use the science and use what we know is out there to help change something positively on your property. Even if you own an acre or 10 acres, 50 acres, whatever. But most of us don't own land, right? So we're in a situation where well, what impact can I have? Find one piece of property and do something. Try to convince that person to do one thing just right out of the box that would positively impact turkeys. Maybe they need prescribed fire. Mm -hmm. Then help them. Maybe they need, um, they've got some early successional grassland that just went in an easement or something and it's poorly managed. Help them. Mm -hmm. um, try to push the narrative on every little piece of property you can, you can impact. And if every single one of us that turkey hunted did that, we'd move the needle. We'd actually have a positive impact because we would go from being thousands and hundreds of thousands of which a very small percentage made an impact on the land into all of us were making an impact on the land. And if we did that, my opinion is, I think we'd see changes. That there are, there are local sportsmen's groups. There okay. are entities, organizations, and groups that you can get involved in that will allow you those types of opportunities. You know, if, if you are a turkey hunter, then hit up your state chairman of National Wild Turkey Federation right. and yeah. call them and say, hey man, or woman, or whoever, I, I wanna help, I wanna do something. Sure. And put it on their plate and see if there's an opportunity that they can identify to help you get involved if you don't have other options you know, to interact with landowners. But I, I've asked this a lot of times. I've asked turkey hunters, I've asked friends, do you know anybody that owns land? And then, it's almost always yes. Yeah. It's like, well, oh, yeah. yeah, I've got an aunt that owns 12 acres. Sure. Well, what's what's Auntie do with her 12 acres? Well, it right. just sits there. Well, do you think you could convince her to, to do something else with it? It's just a it's a pasture that she leases hay cutting rights out. She makes 200 bucks a year off of it. Well, would you pay Auntie 200 bucks? Well, yeah, we'll pay her 200 bucks and let's convert that into warm season grasses. Right. You know, and then we could burn it every every other year. Yeah. Now we've got good brood habitat for turkeys. So the point is, I, I think if you just picked one spot, if we all just picked one spot and we tried to make a positive impact that we'd see, it, we'd make a difference. Sure. Yeah. And I know for some people, like my friend Ben that I mentioned, like that's his weekends. Like that's his that's social act. Yes. Him and his buddies, yeah. every weekend they go to each other's yeah, properties. Yeah, extend your season. They hunt public land. Yeah. Yeah. They don't even hunt these places. <laughs> you know, they just yeah. go, you know, try to improve yeah. habitat and see the results. And yeah. I've been amazed just to see like. It, ex it extends your season. Yeah. You know, like. Pretty cool. So like in two weeks, I'll start strip disking on a piece of property that I don't own it, but, but I can have impact on it. So. Right. I'll be running along plots that I'm going to plant for deer for the summer and I'm going to, I'll start disking those. Well, I'm also strip disking some other fallow areas where all I'm trying to do is create brood habitat to stimulate the seed bank. So does it make a difference? Well, I see birds using it. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm constantly thinking, well, how do I extend my season? I, you know, I'm, I'm not just turkey hunter, I hunt everything. And I, sure. I love to deer hunt, so I'm thinking about deer all year. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, I'm thinking about, well, what could I do right now that would impact my turkeys next year? You know, mm -hmm. what what can I do? The Habitat. Yeah, the future general. of this bird rests on private land. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. I mean, Absolutely. most turkeys live on private land, so yeah. if we don't... Oh, there's way more of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, way yeah. more of yeah. it. Yeah, you know, so yeah. we, we, get, we get into a rut of being critical of the agencies with their management. No, you realize they're managing a tiny percentage, Small percentage. of what uh, we could impact. Mm -hmm. 
so yeah, we, we're, we're going to have to identify ways to work with private landowners and encourage them and sometimes incentivize them sure. to do things that they may not were going to do with their land, uh, such as convert that Ani's mm -hmm. pasture to warm season grasses. Well, if you also told Ani that she could cut hay on that and make more money, or she could do periodic hay you know, cuts instead of cutting fescue two or three times a year, I mean, there are ways that we can work with, with landowners, even on tiny parcels, right. to make better habitat for not just turkeys. And there's sure. programs that landowners can do that oh, are... Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So I mean, there's cost share programs. Exactly. You know, there's, there's easement programs that, that cover most, if not all, of the cost mm -hmm. of restoring or converting lands. I mean, private landowners, I always tell people, if somebody calls me and says, hey, I'm interested in wildlife habitat and I want to do something. Call, contact your local NRCS office, your yeah. Natural Resources Conservation Service, your office, and engage their, their local person and say, look, my objective is wildlife, period. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like to make some money off the timber or whatever the case may be. I want some monetary return on the property, but I, I'm interested in wildlife. And you'll realize there are many, many programs out there that will cover a lot of the cost associated with enhancements for wildlife, 50, 75 percent of the cost, mm. if not more. So yeah, reach out to NRCS. That's what I, I tell people. I think there's yeah. other also like, you know, at least where I grew up, there's a lot of um, other options for like landowners that own, you know, tillable land. They rent it to a farmer and period like that's how they're going to pay the property tax or whatever but there's other programs that they could do to take that tillable ground and make it into wildlife habitat mm. that they actually get sometimes more than they would for mm. renting it programs. yeah, yeah. Or even yeah. like you can still at times you can still harvest like crop off that land right. but if you put a certain corner or you leave a bigger Satisfied. buffer between that and the drainage area you you're gonna get paid for that yeah. in some cases, so it's so and you're gonna it. you're gonna yeah. get a lot of help to do that too. They're not just gonna be like figure it out on your own. There's people yeah. whose jobs are to help you or figure it out. Or knowing when to harvest it. You know, yeah, you know, a lot of yeah. people that you know. There's programs that incentivize cutting later in the season after mm -hmm. nesting season's over. So instead of taking hay off your property three times a year, you know, you might get two cuttings out of it, but you're you know reducing but you get the paid. impact. You get paid, yeah. but you get that. paid to yeah. delay the cutting, yeah. so yeah. it yeah. makes up for it. Yeah. And it's not just crops either. I mean, you've got wetland protection programs, yeah. so you can hold water on your property before it gets drained into like a lake, like Lake Okeechobee. Right. They do big stuff out there too. So I don't know if there's options. I would rather see someone help somebody than get mad at them for not doing something. Like before yeah. you get mad yeah. at them for not doing yeah. anything, yeah. go help them do something. Yeah. 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 Jump on Facebook and go chewing somebody out for blah, 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 blah reason you know yeah. Yeah. Uh, talk to your buddies and get outside and well, do something do, right? so i right? wish that was i so yeah. wish that was reality <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah i so wish that was reality yeah yeah, yeah. well we appreciate you guys yeah. taking thank the you, time with you. us thank you we appreciate you yeah, yeah. man no problem That's we're going great. back to the to the turkey woods to find a turkey camp for the night there you go <laughs> there you go beautiful good luck yeah thanks it works yeah. out <laughs>